Good evening. How is everyone? Great. Good? Good enough? <laughs> uh, Lord, we thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Lord, we thank you that we are upright um, physically, Lord, but that you've stood us up spiritually. I was considering this week how the word says in Romans, Lord, that um, that that we can we we stand, Lord, that you stand us up, um, and and that's in a righteous position, Lord. And, and considering in a Revelation how one day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and many of those very reluctantly, and not from a position of righteousness, Lord. We we've bowed before you in submission, and you stand us up, Lord, and. Uh, one day you're going to seat us um, in the heavenlies. And uh, <laughs> what a thing. So tonight as we worship you, Lord, we just want to do that with the correct perspective, Lord, in this world that's going nuts. Um, we are looking forward to a future with you. And we are looking forward to better things as you've gone to prepare a place for us. That where you are, we may be also, Lord. So we just uh, pray that you would just give us a heart of praise, a heart of thanksgiving. And that you would be pleased with what you see and hear tonight in, in, your, in your bride here as we gather. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song and bless his name all day long and proclaim his mercy day to day. Sing that again. Yeah, sing to the Lord a new song and bless his name all day long and proclaim his mercy day to day. For he's the Lord, he's to be feared above all gods, all honor and majesty.
tortured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you You open my eyes to your wonders anew You've captured my heart with this love Cause nothing on earth is as beautiful as you Beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my, my soul it must see, beautiful one I love, beautiful one I adore, beautiful one my soul. My soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. Beautiful one. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. My soul, my soul must sing. nothing that compares to you. Nothing has entered into the heart of man, the mind of man. Lord, we, we heard in your word that if, if someone was to really utter what was seen in heaven, to truly describe it, it would be a crime, Lord. Because it's something we can't even understand. It wouldn't be done justice, Lord. So consider the greatness, Lord, that that you you contain, Lord, that the greatness of your love, your might, your majesty, your righteousness, Lord. That you would humble yourself and you would become sin for us, Lord. You would take on the polar opposite of what you are. All driven by love, Lord. We, we can't imagine that. And that thing that you've done for us is truly beautiful. What, what else could it be? It comes from you and you are the beautiful one. Lord, the lover of our souls. <laughs> Lord, it was you who created the heaven. Lord, it was your hand put stars in their place. Lord, it is your Commands the morning, even oceans and their winds, they bow at your feet. Lord, who am I compared to your glory?
Yes, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Lord, I love you. We love you. Nothing compares. We can't turn anywhere else, Lord. Whom have I in heaven but you, God? Hmm. Lord, to be the thief on the cross, Lord, that the next instant we're with you in paradise. Lord, we are so anxious for that day when you call us home. It's one thing to be free of this world, Lord, but it's quite another to be in your presence. And there's fullness of joy, Lord. Thank you to put off this tent. We await that day, Lord. Uh, we love you. And we'll just pray tonight, Lord, that you would teach us from your word. You'd mold us more and form us more into your image. Um, so it's a good one. <laughs> In Jesus' name, amen. All right, kiddos, you can... <laughs> not, not the big kiddos, the little kiddos. They can <laughs> head out with Brian. There's always a big kiddo in the crowd trying to slip out. I heard there's candy or a snack or something over there. <laughs> well, it's good to be back. Good to be back. It was great to see our beautiful country. As many of you know, my wife and I, we, uh, well, we were originally going to go to Texas. We wanted to see the Gulf Coast for our anniversary, but... Uh, Plans got changed, and so we said, that's it, road trip. And, uh, you know, and as far as being in the U.S., I've, I've pretty much gone from Anchorage to, well, on the, this continent anyways, all the way down to Mexico City, but never really been east other than an airport of Boise. And just with all the craziness and people throwing a big fit about Mount Rushmore, we're like, that's it, we're going to see it. And we went and saw some other national parks and and just a wonderful time in the Lord and with each other and to celebrate the gift that he's given us. And, and not only in each other and in marriage, but in this country. And I'll tell you, it was a good dose um, and a real blessing to be there at Rushmore when, when the sun's going down, they click the lights on and they're honoring a whole group of vets and everybody sings the national anthem. And, and just it was just a wonderful reminder of how God has shed his grace on this land and and that we that we sing to celebrate and we sing to remember and we honor those things and, and it was it was just a real blessing and good for me yeah it was just a wonderful trip and <laughs> if any of you guys are friends with my wife on Facebook I'm sure you probably know more about it than I remember um, no shortage of videos and pictures but uh but a good time and a blessing but good to be home good to be back with you guys um, I want to thank you for your prayers. As some of you know, maybe not all of you know, um, on Sunday, my, uh, my mom had a, a pretty massive stroke. And, um, and so, on Sunday morning, she gets a lot of time by herself, so it was quite some time before anybody found her. Um, so they missed the window to be able to really go in and repair most of the, the tissue was already damaged or or dead from a lack of circulation. Um, 
So we've been kind of going back and forth uh, this week. I spent all day yesterday and with her in the hospital. But um, the procedure that they would need to do, um, she she's past the age four. It would do more damage than good, most likely. And so they tried a last-ditch medication yesterday to see if, because with that kind of trauma, you begin to build fluid. And um, so it began to, to shift and to push on her brain. And, and so um, she lost most of her function yesterday afternoon. So that I got all this out yesterday. So today, they don't, they don't have hospice when you're in the hospital, so it's just moved to um, comfort care. And, um, and so it'll probably be a matter of days. And um, I was thankful to the Lord. And <laughs> it'll kind of tie into some of the scriptures interesting enough tonight, but I was thankful to the Lord that yesterday, kind of on the, the last of her, really kind of be able to communicate in cognitive um, because she wasn't on comfort care or hospice, you know, if you're not sure what comfort care is, it's kind of the equivalent, um, that because she wasn't on that yet, she was only allowed um, one visitor per day. Um, you can go as many times as you want, but you're only allowed one visitor per day right now in mercy for that sort of thing. And, hey, it was me. So she got a good dose of Galatians and the gospel and... You know, so thankful for that time and for your prayers and to continue to pray as, you know, the ability to hear and respond is long or to be able to hear and respond with the spirit and with the inner woman lasts oftentimes much longer than the ability to physically respond. Um, so, appreciate your continued prayer for that, for the family. A um, lot of unsaved family. And, uh, you know, these are things that God uses. So, Father, as we get into your word, Lord, may we be thankful for not only our family, for our loved ones, Lord, but, our, but the family that sits in this room as well. Lord, as you have made them in your image, <laughs> and sometimes, much to our surprise, you made each one of us on purpose. And you love us. And in your image, and you've given each one, Lord, honor. And you've made a plan for their life. And God, may we not waste our days on the things of the flesh, Lord. The Ishmaels in our life, as we're going to see. But just be race, resting in the, your grace. That each day, fully trusting and walking as a friend of God, is a day well invested. So Lord, as we look here into this chapter, the, the obvious choice, Lord, may it again be reminded that it is the obvious choice for us as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So we'll be in Galatians chapter 4, in case it's been so long that you don't remember. Uh, we've been cruising along through Galatians, um, amazing book. It is one that I love to come back to every couple years uh, because I have plenty of Ishmaels in my life, plenty of times where I get tired of waiting on God and I begin to do it myself. And Galatians says, stop, reminds me to go back. Because they had been, prior to coming to Jesus, like all of us, we'd been in the law's classroom. Paul had been in it. The Jews had been in it. By our conscience or what we knew of God, we were in it. You're in, and the classroom was simple. It was a simple lesson. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. Go back tomorrow. What's the curriculum about? You're a sinner. <laughs> and eventually, okay, okay, I got that. And it says, well, now you need a Savior. And you receive Jesus and you've graduated from that. But the Galatians, they were the type of people, well, we graduated with our masters, but now we want to go back to kindergarten. I want to go back and hear that I'm a sinner. I want to go back and hear that I need a savior. I want to go back under the law, bondage, weakness, poverty. 
Paul is going to remind them, that was your choice. That's what you're choosing. This is, what is the obvious choice? And this is in us, you know, I, I think about with, with kids or maybe a friend or maybe your spouse where maybe you've asked them to do something or you expected them to do it and you got your timeline and it didn't get done, so that's it, I'm doing it myself. <laughs> that's, we love to do that. Tired of waiting. I'm just going to do it. I can do it. I'm going to do it. Well, God's going to take this story here later on in chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 8 here in a minute, but you know, pull this story that wasn't just about a dysfunctional family or the craziness of this little piece of history, but he says there's more to it. It teaches us spiritually when it comes to Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael. Teach us to graduate from kindergarten of the elementary things, the weak, the beggarly things that was supposed to lead us somewhere. These guys wanted to go back. So up to this point in chapters 1 through 3, Paul's really kind of laying out the Apostle Paul. Laying out some theology, laying out some truth. Don't go after a different gospel. But he pauses here in chapter 4 for a minute before we get to the, the shoe leather, the practical applications of chapter 5 and 6. And we get a, a, a glimpse at Paul the man. His heart. You know, he laid out some theology. He laid out the reality. And, and he based it all on the fact that he was an apostle there in chapter 1. But he, he's going to, in this chapter, he's going to pour out his heart to these guys that he knew personally. And impacted. And they impacted him. And, and he impacted them in a powerful way. And he's going to go back to that relationship. Before we get to the shoe leather of what he's taught... He's going to appeal just kind of on that relationship with them. The love and the patience of Paul. Love and the patience of Paul. Because I think, you know, with the, whether the Judaizers that came in and kind of tricked these guys into going back to the law or to desire that. Because you've got a lot of nerve. You've got a lot of nerve, I, I think, to argue with the Apostle Paul on the Old Testament. I mean, you better bring your A game. I mean, he knew, he knew, he knew the law. So Galatians chapter 4, as Paul has defended the gospel, he's laid out justification, the fact that the law brings a curse and we're saved by the unchanging promise of God. He laid out the purpose of the law. And now as we come into verse 8, with all the theology, with the facts and with the verses and everything on the line, he's going to say, here's my heart. Here's my concern for you. Here's my love for you. Verse 8. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature were not gods. But now, after you have known God, or rather, are known by God... How is it that you turn again to the weak and the beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? Question mark. You observe days and months and seasons and years. I am afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vanity, in vain. So he opens up this new paragraph. He begins to crack open this fresh part of his heart. And he says, look, man, <laughs> when you were in the world, you used to serve things, and you used to serve these little gods, and you served these little things in your life, and you, you knew it wasn't God. By nature, it wasn't God, nothing. I mean, you made it with your hands, or you made it up in your mind and said, wow, okay, that's God. And it, wasn't, it just wasn't by nature God. It wasn't anything. He says, but now, after you have known God, but rather are known by God, and that's an important thing, okay, it's good to... Good to know some things about God. Say, in, a good example to me is like, um, if I got invited to the White House to some kind of briefing or something, and I got to shake hands with the president, and I had a two, two minute or two second, you know, hey, how you doing? Hi, and somebody says, oh man, did you get to meet the president? Yeah. Oh man, do you know him? No. You know, that's one thing I got to experience. I could tell you a little bit about him. But if I walked into say like a dinner, and I'm sitting down kind of on the corner, and the president walks in and says, James. Man, I'm so glad to see you. What are you doing on that end of the table? Get up here. That's way better. It's one thing that they 
that they knew God or came to some understanding, it was way better, he says, rather to be known by God. When God looks at these guys in Galatia or looks at you and says, oh man, I know him. I like that guy. I like that gal. That's better. It's one thing to say, oh yeah, you can claim I'm friends with God, but it's another thing when God says, that's my friend. Rather to be known by him. He says, how can you go from that? And he's going to come back on this in a few different ways. It says, how is it that you turn again to the weak? And that word weak kind of gives the same idea as that, that beggar that was by the beautiful gate that, that John and Peter came up to and was crippled from his youth and, and, you know, hey, man, gold and silver I don't have, but this is what I do have. That crippled, that weakness is kind of the same idea. This, you want to go back to something that has no power. It can't even stand on its own. It's weak. It's crippled. It was never designed to produce life and strength and growth. It was designed to let you know. I mean, the law was given to put this straight line out to know where you're not. As, as Paul would say in Romans, it was designed to shut every mouth. Jew, Gentile, you are all sinners and you need a savior. You want to go back to that classroom again? No. <laughs> not, not any, I don't want to go back to that classroom. He said, why are you going back to that weak thing? The beggarly is it's like the same word that it's gives, uh, that's brought out in Lazarus and the rich man. As he sat out and he begged and he, and he just even for the scrap or the crumb of the rich man. That's, that's, the, that's the idea, the beggarly. It doesn't have anything. It's in poverty. It just wants that scrap. It's going to just needs that little bit because it doesn't have anything of its own. He said, that's what the law is going to give you. That's what you're going back to. You want to go back to the weak and beggarly elements? To which you desire to be, and here's the end of it, in bondage? You want to, wait a second, you want to go from being known by God to slave. He's, he begins to appeal him, as, as, and we're going to see it's, it's from a friend. I've been told in, in the Greek, this isn't, the, the words and the adjectives and the, the way it's written is not a cutting statement. But it's one just stated by a friend, and we'll come back to that again. He says, you want to go back to that? And, here, and here's, he says, look, you observe days and months and seasons and years. So we know from Paul's life, it wasn't about if you wanted to celebrate the feast. You know, if you wanted to spend some time as a family and say, you know what, Passover is cool and we're going to do it because we want to see how it relates to Jesus. And we're just going to kind of walk it out. We're going to have a Seder dinner, if you will. That's cool. Went over to a friend's house. They're believing Christian, but of Jewish heritage. And every Friday night, they, they go through a, a, a Sabbath dinner. And it's cool. A lot of the early church had much of that Jewish custom still in their life. Many of them still worshipped on Saturday. It wasn't until it really went Gentile that began more and more to worship on Sunday, the day which the Lord raised, because that for a Gentile was much, much more impactful. The resurrection rather than creation. And he, but, but they began to observe it because they thought it made it more, them more special, closer to God. It wasn't about celebrating and, and enjoying God. They, they went back to these days. They began to engage and to worship and to dive into these things to be more pleasing to God. Rather than celebrating the Christ of the Passover, they were going back to Passover. Rather than celebrating Jesus who is our rest, they were going back to Sabbath rule and regula regulation as if Rest in the flesh would bring rest to the spirit. They began to do these things. Paul said, what are you doing? You're going from power to weakness. You're going wealth to poverty. We're not, we don't want to be in a place where we go beyond the word of God and we begin to legislate legal activities, things that we do in the flesh to please God. We don't look for praise or reward for celebrating a day. You can celebrate Christmas because you want to praise and 
the Lord and celebrate the provision of God. But if you expect praise or honor or some kind of give and take from God because you came to church on Christmas or because you celebrated Christmas, that's not the way it works. See, and that's what they began to do. They, they came in, and maybe they came in with the argument that Paul lays out in Romans. He says, look, you guys are wild olive trees. You're getting grafted into the natural olive tree. Don't you want to look like that? You want to be, don't you want to look more spiritual? Come on, you guys are... You guys sound rough. You look rough. Probably wear shorts to church. And maybe a hat. T-shirt. <laughs> Probably didn't tuck it in. <laughs> Don't you want to look more spiritual? You know, I say that, I mean, because those are things that, you know, I got to wear shorts on church on Sunday. I was pretty pumped. I don't usually wear them when I teach, but maybe I should. I don't know. <laughs> maybe some cutoffs. Yeah. That would look really redneck. But anyways. <laughs> but we, there's something in our flesh that gets drawn to that, Right? The outward appearance. And what we do with our hair and what we do with our body, obviously there's a place for honoring God in those things. You know, obviously. God cares about those things. You know, he's not into slobby kids. But by golly, if his kids, that's the way they are, that's the way they dressed or they couldn't change before work, come on in. He's glad to see you. They, they were drawn back in by this appearance of spirituality. Drawn back in that if God's just an equation or God, work following God, it becomes just a, a vending machine. I take out my two quarters. One is, I kept all the Sabbath regulation. I put that in. The other one is, I don't know, I, my mouth's been doing really good lately. I didn't take the names, Lord's name in vain. Ching, ching. Now I press A2, and out comes this blessing. And the more I do that, the more I go to the vending machine, and the more I get from God. Right? That's what they, 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 they had duped them into. Paul said, I mean, and we'll come back to obedience, because obedience is important. But why we obey is also of absolute utmost importance. And so he's like, were you guys stillborn? Did you come out alive? Because the fact is they had lost something in their relationship with God. Probably a little similar to the Ephesians by the time Revelation came along. They'd left something out. The love, the intimacy. That I did it just because it pleased God. And he was smiling at me before I even did it. You know, he's, he's smiling in love with you before you got up and did your devotion in the morning. It wasn't, you know, wasn't, oh, sometimes we, well, you know, after I've done my devotion, I'm all prayed up for the day. Now God's favor is upon me. I'm ready. I don't know about between 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., but somehow God's grace kept me till I could do a devotion and get all filled up again. It, devotions are a good thing. We want to be prayed up. We want to spend time with our Father. We want to get our heart right. But he was pleased with you already. Because it's Jesus. Because you're free. Not to go back into bondage. The law becomes, and I'm beating this to death, I suppose, but the law becomes like this tree. It grows up and it's out in your field or perhaps in your yard and you planted it. And you're like, man, that should, that should look better. It should have more fruit by now. It should be more blessed by now for sure. So I'm going to run down to the store and I'm going to buy a big bag of apples and some duct tape. And I'm going to tape apples on that tree. When people go by, they're going to see it's got a lot of fruit on it. It didn't come from the tree, but it is real fruit. You can, you know, you can eat it and you can look at it and say, wow, that, apple, that tree does have a lot of apples on it. And that's technically true but that's not by God's design. It's by our effort. And we're going to see that they're trying to hang fruit on the tree. Verse 12. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. So Paul, he's, he's, he, he said, you're going back to those days, those feasts and the, the Passover. You're going back to the, to the law. 
he said, look, I left those things. By the grace of God, I could come in and live like a Gentile to the glory of God and to minister to you. And I urge you to become like me, not dependent upon the weak and the beggarly things. Look, it didn't hurt me at all, Paul would say, to be able to leave those things behind and to become like all men that I might gain some. But I urge you, Paul would say, become like me. It's not where we get our righteousness from. Become consistent in that. And Paul says, you know, you haven't injured me at all. I'm not saying this, Paul. I'm not saying this because you've offended me. I'm not saying this from bitterness or a hurt heart. It's because I love you. Verse 13, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? He calls back that salvation, that, that first love, as he, as he got to pour into their life and experience that with them. He says, what was that you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out, and it's, it's like this dig out, like when they dug up the tiles to let the paralytic man down to Jesus. It was this dug, you would have dug out your own eyes. He said, you would have plucked them out. Uh, Got to go back. And given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? He calls back to that relationship when they, man, they were on fire. God had done many amazing things in the region of Galatia. But Paul gives us a little insight. He says, because of, in person, because of physical infirmity, I was there. Which is a good one for when the health and wealth comes spinning back around as it always does every five to ten years or so. A lot of people argue, what is this physical infirmity? Because Paul said, that's the reason I was there. It doesn't seem that it was because of his stoning, because he was already in Galatia when he got stoned in Acts 14, I believe it is. It doesn't... Some people try to go with, there was a lot of eye problems in the Roman culture those days, because you had fires with no chimneys, you... You cooked and your, your lamps would, you know, oh, there was a lot of smoke in the air. And Paul was a reader, and so he would have spent a lot of time in there in the evenings or in the wintertime by a lamp that would put out a lot of smoke. And that would cause uh, this, just this ugly weeping eye disease that was pretty common on that day. Um, I could be. The most likely and the, probably the best case, again, I, I love what one commentator said, he said, it's hard enough to diagnose a patient that's right in front of you, let alone one that's been dead for 2,000 years. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. What a lot of people wind up at, and, and probably is correct, um, in my opinion, is in Acts 13, Paul was coming in off the Mediterranean Sea, and he came into around this place called Perga. And down there in the lowland, right off the sea, there was, there was a lot of swampy land, and it was very well known for it. They had a... Oh, Massive problem with malaria in that area. And that particular strain and that type did, did cause, among headaches and all sorts of different things, um, issues with the eyes. And so it's thought that because of that, and that's also where it's believed by, again, the same crowd that Mark bailed out because, it's, anyways, it was, it, was a horrific, it was a horrific place to be. Um, armies and other things had problems in that area as well. So many believe that that's where Mark actually bailed out on that first missionary journey and Paul to get up out and away from it with his entourage went up into the upper plains of Galatia to get up out away from all the stagnant water and everything. And that's the reason why this infirmity drove me to this place. I don't know. You can dig into it and, and come to your own conclusion on it. But the fact is the word says that Paul said, you know that because of physical infirmity, it was the mode, it was the reason, it was the driving factor that I preached the gospel to you at first. And that to me, is, that's powerful. When was the last time you, you stopped and took a look at this thing that is bad in my life, because not all things are good, but God works all things for the good. 
did I take this infirmity, my sickness, my illness, my busted up car, my issue in life that drove me to a place that I would never be to share with a person I would have never otherwise seen. And Paul glorified God in that. They saw the hand of God in that. And they saw him, and, and in their culture, as it says there, they could have despised him because oftentimes if you were sick or had an issue in your life like that, they would say, oh, you're cursed by God. Obviously, you've displeased God or something or something's wrong with your faith or whatever because otherwise you wouldn't be sick. But they didn't. They received him as a messenger of God. So much that, man, God, you know, Jesus is working through you. They received him as Jesus, as as God's or Jesus' messenger directly to them. And, and so moved by the grace of God and so transformed was their life and so loved by Paul and they loved Paul as well that they said, man, if, if, I, could, if I could fix you, I would. I, I'd take out my own eyes for you, Paul. I love you and I recognize what God's doing in your life. It was that kind of connection, that kind of power, that kind of love that they had. And he said, what are you guys doing? Do you not remember that? You ever have those moments where in your life with a friend or a family or in your marriage or something where you got to stop and say, man, where are we at? Do you remember when we used to be in this place? Remember when we had this experience together? Remember when we honestly, with all of our hearts, said there's nothing I wouldn't do for you? I love you that much. Paul said, man, that's what the gospel did for you. That's what God did in us. Do you remember? I'm not your enemy. He reminds them in verse 16. Am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? Let's flip to Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. It's a pretty common verse. You may know it, you may not. But it's an it's a important one. I might actually even back up to verse 5 because it really goes together. Proverbs chapter 27, beginning in verse 5. Open rebuke is better than love carefully concealed. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. He's like, man, these guys are coming up, and they're like, hey, come be our disciples, and we'll help you take it to the next level and give you that secret knowledge, and you'll be holy, and they're just smooching on them. And Paul said, they're bringing you to poverty. They're taking you from strength to weakness. They're taking you from, again, the, the, the glory and the grace of God to slavery. They're kissing on you, but that's, but it's deceitful. He said, yeah, maybe I'm wounding you. Maybe this is open and this is hard to hear, but this is because I love you. Remember that relationship? That's me talking. That's not somebody who's just there to rob your wallet or to get a bigger church. This is me talking, Paul said. Remember the love we had? Remember how you received me? Remember how God moved in our life? Proverbs 18.1, I think, is also a good one to go along with that as it talks about a person who isolates themselves and they rage against all sound judgment. That's probably a pretty bad quote, so you might want to look it up in Proverbs 18.1. And that's what they're doing. They're isolating themselves from the one that loved them the most. They're going with these people who do not love them. Verse 17, they zealously court you. And that court, or another translation would say, affect you. You use the word court because, you know, back then, you know, they didn't roll up in your sweet ride and rev your engine and say, hey, you want to go watch a movie? It was usually a, a process of courtship. And during that process, once you made the negotiation, you, you would begin to try to win the affection, the attention. You would zealously pursue that guy or that gal, probably usually the gal. He said, that's what they're doing to you. But it says, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. And it's kind of a mouthful in there. But basically, they, they want to win you as a disciple so they can turn around and once they've got their hooks in you and you're now, you know, they want to convert usually from other converts, they usually aren't out talking to the lost. 
want a convert, now the first thing you need to realize is that there's a separation between us. Much like the Nicolaitans in Revelation. That there is a class to Christianity. Now that's great, you came, and now you're beginning to be more spiritual. But remember that we are highly elevated, and you need to pursue where we are. By works, and by the law, and by you know, just going for it. Not by faith, not by Christ. And so it's kind of a mouthful there, but basically they zealously court you, but it's not good. They want to exclude you, so you'll be zealous for them. So that there's this secret higher level by hard works that I can reach. The secret knowledge that those guys got. 1,500 years of learning how to obey the law and to really look spiritual. Someday I'll be like them. Verse 18. But is it good? But it is good to be zealous. And that's true. In a good thing always. And not only when I am present with you. So Paul said, hey, man, if someone's trying to talk you into being zealous for a good thing, go for it. But this isn't one of them. My little children for whom I labored in birth again until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you and to change my tone for I have doubts about you. Paul said, look man, and whether this is kind of more from a mother's perspective or a midwife's perspective, I'm not really sure. But he said, look, I labored, bringing from darkness to light, seeing life come into your life. And I do it all over again for you until Christ is formed in you. He said, but I want, I want you to note this. I'm, I'm not going to email this. This aspect I'm not going to write. I'm not going to text because you need to hear my tone of voice. You need to see my eyes. You need to see my countenance. That this isn't because I'm personally injured. It's not because I'm maybe not Paul the Apostle in your eyes. It's because I love you and I want to see you grow in the Lord. And I'm having doubts. Were you guys stillborn? You know, did, did I miss something? Did you really come to Jesus? I say, Paul needs this affirmation as well. And so he begins to speak to this on the verse 21. Tell me. You who desire to be under the law, do you hear the law? So with the spiritual ear, this is again kind of a, an allegory, a deeper meaning within the story. Doesn't change the history or the facts of the story as many try to with allegories. But, but within that, we see something deeper and more. It's not just a, a goofy family. It says, it is written that Abraham had two sons. The one by the bondwoman and the other by a free woman. So a slave and a free woman. And they would have understood this because it's, it's said some estimate as high as six slaves to one free person in the Roman Empire at this time. Millions of them. Galatians, there were probably plenty of slaves in this church. It would be, they would be able to grab a hold of some of this. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And he of the free woman through promise, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is, or earthly Jerusalem. And, in the, in, and is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem from above, the heavenly Jerusalem, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you, are, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has more children than she who has a husband. As Paul reaches, there goes from Genesis and reaches into Isaiah when speaking of the Messiah. He says, tell me, I'm going to reach into this, and do you hear the law? Do you hear what the Word of God is saying? It's because we get caught up in that, right? We want to dig in, and we want to find out action. Rubber meets the road. We want to do all these tangible checkmark things. And the problem is, every once in a while, we've got to examine that in the light of the grace of God, because the Pharisees, 
Do you remember what Jesus told them? He said, you know, you search the scriptures. That's good. For in them you think you have life. Which Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. Okay. But he said that they are the very things that testify of me. They began to search for what they wanted. They began to search for their kudos. They began to search for their coins to put in the vending machine rather than for God. And it's a very dangerous place to be. Paul says, I want you to look beyond this because this was pointing to a person, not just an event, not just things to learn, not just history, but it was all reaching and looking forward to the one, Jesus Christ. The one that would set free. So in this, Abraham, so Genesis 13, he's approximately 75, and he gets this promise from God. And he believes, and it's accounted to him for righteousness. God says, belief, your account before me, you're righteous. And so we grab a hold of that and remember that you are a child of God. You're right with God by faith, by grace through faith alone, in the promise of God. But as we're going to look at friendship, as we're going to look at other things, that it, it gets a little bit more complicated. So as Abraham's life went on, he said, oh no, I'm going to die, so hey Sarah, lie for me. And then it goes on, thought he mastered that, comes back again 10 you know, years later, and he does it again. And, and now all of a sudden it's been, I don't know, Genesis 16, they're getting impatient. It's been about 10 years. He's probably in his mid-80s, 85, 86. And Sarah says, <laughs> it ain't happening. It ain't happening because God was waiting, as Roman 4 points out, until they were both as good as dead reproductively. Impossible. Barren. Never going to happen. So they got tired of waiting for God. I'm going to do it myself. Eh, that's, that's where we love to be. And so, they brought in Hagar, a slave. And said, God, we're not waiting on you. I can take care of this myself. If all I need is a son, got it. We can do it. I can handle this. It's been a long time, 10 years, Lord. Obviously, this must be what you want me to do. So they, you know, no problem. Works like a charm. Out comes Ishmael the next year. Then we come to Genesis chapter 17. And now we're probably at least a good solid 13 years later. Abraham's getting up around 99. God visits him. Says, hey, remember that promise? <laughs> Abraham laughs. Of course, we know the famous one. Sarah laughed also. They both laughed. Whether they had both different intentions, I don't know. but Because... God kind of chastised Sarah a little bit, but, but they both laughed. And Romans is clear. He waited till it was impossible. That, that the promise, that the life that would be brought forth, the son that would be had, would be impossible by human means. And it would be a child of a free, and it would bring laughter and joy. It would not be the child of a slave born into bondage because Ishmael would have been born into that. Might have been somewhat free because of Abraham, but born of a slave. And so as we come to that, and God would make that promise, and Abraham says, oh no, you know, I love Ishmael. I've got used to him. I know, I know all of his intro idiosyncrasies. I could tell when he's lying to me. I, I got him down. And he says, God, oh, that Ishmael would live before me. I got, my, I got my comfort zone, God. I, I got a good bead on this. I know how to do this. I got the, you know, my checklist, and, and I, I check it off, and, and it's good to go. God says, no. Going to give him a, the promise through Sarah. Mm. And so Paul digs into that, and he says, listen to the Holy Spirit on this. Hagar, the law. It's bondage. It's bondage. What you accomplish in the flesh, not waiting for the promise of God, and it ultimately comes back to Jesus and what you trust in the flesh or you trust in the Son. 
So where are you going to be? What are you going to do? And the Holy Spirit writes that for us because each one of us comes tonight, either with a temptation to, or we've already given in to a Hagar and an Ishmael in our life. We got them. This region, this group of churches, they were buying into it. They were going back to it. And though they were a son of God by faith, James points out that we are friends by obedience, that we walk with him, that there's a relationship when we respond. Because without obedience, there is no fruit. We have to walk in it. It's a different obedience than a servant has, but a son obeys regardless. A friend interacts and responds regardless. And so it's not a workspace for salvation. So Sarah, grace, Sarah and Isaac, grace, born of a miraculous birth from a free woman corresponds with the heavenly Jerusalem. Isaac was brought forth by God's power in joy and laughter. We're going to see in a minute, as he grew, there was persecution with it. Hagar and Ishmael give us an idea of the flesh and the law. The flesh, best way, a good simple way to define it is to, to chop off the H and spin it around. It's not about skin and bone, it's about self. You want to think about your flesh, that, what that desires, it's yourself. Selfishness. Ishmael was a son of a slave, earthly, just like Jerusalem, in bondage. So let me finish this up real quick. Verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise, but as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit. Even so, it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. The law will not be heir. The law will not come in with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, why are not children of the bondwoman? You are not children. We are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. But the free. Bondage and legalism gave birth to slaves. Hagar would never marry, would not move on. But that which cannot be done in the flesh is done by the power of God. When you cannot save yourself, when you cannot know there is not one righteous, no, not one, it's done by the power of God, by the Son of the free woman, if you will, by Jesus Christ, by the miraculous birth, by the promised fulfilled. And Paul says, that's what we're of. We're not of that. Don't go back to slavery. So what is... As this tries to creep in as the legalists in our life, now first I guess I'll deal with the persecution. As the free woman, as the, the promise of God grew and as there was joy, there also came persecution. And you'll notice the first one to persecute the church also was the nation of, of Israel. The first persecutors of the Jews, or of Christians, were, were the Jews because of this principle. Because of that. And we see that in our own life as we, as God begins to move and you're filled with joy. And whether it's just an attack from yourself, your, your own flesh, or those around you. You're too radical or what are you doing? That comes with it as well. And Paul points that out. So what is the Hagar or the Ishmael in your life? It's contrary to the Spirit's work. It's probably something that you could read, maybe even a verse, and say, never mind, God, I'll do it. God brought a man, put him in a hard situation in life to give these guys the gospel. You know, and I guess I'll, I suppose I'll touch on it for a minute. And even in my own life, I guess, I'll, I'll kind of wind down with this. Um, in my my own situation, my mom right now um, was the only one for a day 
they got to sit with her. A lady who's been studying the teaching of the Watchtower for about 35 years of her life. We've got to talk a lot. But in one last moment, in a moment of infirmity, in a place, in a situation that could not otherwise be, when she's 80 years old, God puts her in a situation where she's going to hear the gospel again. And she's going to hear the word all day long. But we have in the mix also what always tries to creep in is this temptation to grab a hold of Hagar which corresponds with the law and bring in the flesh, the Ishmael in our life, that we can do it. Not trusting in the grace and the promise of God, but the strength of flesh. Trying to invent and bring about our own spirituality. Maybe take a look at that and pray on that this week. It's so easy to go back to. Maybe you're tired of waiting. Maybe it just doesn't feel as good to wait on what God wants to do as doing it yourself. But what is the, the Hagar and the Ishmael in your life? Are you letting those hard circumstances bring you in a place to share Jesus like you never would before? There's an interesting, another mouthful I'll leave you with to kind of digest. You are only free when you are not free to be free of God. You are only free when you are not free to be free of God. When you're free of God, you're a slave. When God's working in your life and He won't let that go and He won't let you go down that road, He's got Paul writing to you again and He's sending you people and, and you're just nagging on you, don't do that, don't go there. God is, laying, God is desiring to bring you to a path of freedom. You're His son. You're His daughter and you're free. But when you're free to pursue those things, when you reject it, He says you're in bondage. You went back to those things which you were delivered from. So Father, we thank you for this evening, Lord. There's a lot in there, a lot of heavy stuff. And Lord, sometimes your preacher goes long. But God, may we take an honest examination as these things, Lord, as these sins are common to mankind. They're common to us. Where maybe you've promised us something in the past. Or maybe you've been leading us in a place and we just don't understand why it's not happening yet. Why that spiritual gift hasn't developed in my life yet. Why that promise hasn't come to pass yet, Lord. God, help us to wait on you. Help us to set our eyes on you. Lord, <laughs> I know the things that I've done apart from you. Lord, and they all just wound up being in a big mess. God, we want to, we, Lord, we want to do the things that your Spirit's into. The God who can take a sickness or an infirmity or a misdirection or a mistake or maybe an entire sinful life and He can turn it around and use it for His glory and cause great joy and, and this miraculous event, Lord. May we leave these things in Your hands. Because in you, Lord, we are free indeed. God, may we not go from wealth to poverty, strength to weakness, free to slaves, but Lord, may we rejoice in our great salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, Travis had a couple personal things to take care of, so there's, uh, we won't close with a song unless... You want to go a cappella? <laughs> I happen to pull something out of my pocket. Do you have uh, the words, Carla, maybe for nothing but the blood? So we'll take a minute and close that. Cause, man, it's just been a good book and a good reminder. There's just things that we, that we pull up along the way. Man, because God's timing, it is just not ours. Amen. But we want to stay rested, trusted 
in him. Paul had a sickness that brought him to a place to preach the gospel. Right now we got all sorts of craziness in our world and it has opened doors to preach the gospel. May we do the same. How are we coming along? All right. Okay. Whew. I'm going to shake out all the nerves. Worship leader I am not. So here we go. Don't leave me hanging. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but...